So good to be with you. It's good to see you. If you are visiting, we're glad you are with us. And uh, so thankful that you took time to come and share this morning of worship with us here at Highland Heights. Uh, we've had a few folks who have been traveling. Glad to have you home. We've had a few folks who have been sick. We're glad to have you back. Uh, over the weekend, we had, a, we had a great men's retreat. 21 of us went up to Camp Latimer over in Spencer and uh, had a great, great time of study looking at the blessings of God on His men. Uh, Jeff and Jeremy Knox did a fantastic job of conducting our thoughts on the blessings of being a child of God, the blessings of being a father, a Christian father, and the blessings of being a Christian grandfather. Uh, we got to spend time sometime outside. It rained on us most of the day yesterday, but it was good. And uh, we actually brought a bunch of cornhole boards in and we tossed cornhole for a couple of hours. And just it was a really, really great time. And uh, when, when these events come up, if you were not able to come, we missed you and we hope that you'll be able to come next go around. And uh, ladies, I know you have the mother-daughter brunch coming up this next week, this, this coming weekend. Uh, just in case you are uh, not aware of this, we call it mother-daughter brunch, but it may be that some of you don't have a mother who's here or you don't have a daughter who's here, or, uh, but, but that doesn't mean you can't adopt one for the day, right? And so go out and find one of these either younger ladies or one of these older ladies that, that uh, may be by themselves here at Highland Heights and say, hey, would you be my mom for the day or would you be my daughter for the day and, and, join, and join me at this? And so I'm, I know that you ladies are going to have a fantastic, fantastic time uh, that day. It, uh, it, it, really has, it really is a blessing to be a part of this family. And God is doing great things with and through and for Highland Heights. I, I mentioned that we were at the retreat and um, the, the very first night that, that we were there at this men's retreat, our uh, Jeff discussed a little bit of the idea of, of having peace uh, as being a blessing of being a child of God. And, and, and in the midst of that conversation, he, he raised a question. He, he asked us to describe or define what, what is peace. And, uh, and it, was, it was good to hear the different conversations. And, and I guess maybe a way he kind of said, what does peace look like in your life? And, and you heard a couple of different things, but I, I think many of those ideas all kind of came around to that idea of calmness, trying to be calm and, and trying to feel an inner calmness in, 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 in life and despite the things that are going. We talked about things like, is it harder to find peace now than it used to be? And it, it was really interesting conversation. But, but the more I've thought about that, I, uh, I, I've, I've spent a little bit of time just kind of pondering, you know, when we talk about wanting to find peace, what, in what situations are we typically talking about? finding peace. Well, I think for a lot of us, uh, we, <laughs> we start looking for peace in the midst of that crazy, hectic schedule, right? Maybe you're one of those moms that has a couple of rugrats going all around you during the day and, and, and you're trying to get them dressed, you're trying to get them fed, you're trying to get them out the door for school. Oh, and by the way, you gotta, you gotta make sure that the house is cleaned up and maybe you have a job, so you gotta get to work too. And then you gotta make sure, oh, we've got a soccer practice later on, we've got volleyball practice, we've got softball practice, we've got basketball practice. Um, and, and, and so you're running, 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 running all the time. And then when the kids don't get what they want, what do you start saying? Hey, mama, I need this, I need this, I need this. And somewhere along the way, what do you moms do? You kind of throw something down and say, oh, I just need a little bit of peace. Or maybe, maybe you are that career person. Maybe you go to work every day and you have one of those higher stress jobs and, and you, you, you go in early in the morning you don't get home till late at night, and the phone is always ringing. There's emails dinging on your, on your laptop or on your phone or your tablet constantly all throughout the day. You are, you are busting it, trying to get it all done, and, 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 and as soon as you get one project done, you, you, you're up against a deadline, and as soon as you get one project done, you reach that deadline, you turn around, you've got another one due in just a few days. And as soon as you get that one done, you've got another one due in a few days, and the boss is kind of breathing down your neck to meet certain quotas, or, or you, and, and it's just nonstop, and no matter how how hard you try, 
You never seem to get ahead. You never seem to get on top of it and you're tired and your brain hurts and, and, and you're stressed and you think to yourself in some of your lower times, oh, I just want a little bit of peace. And then the other side of peace, the other, the other type of peace that we talk about winds up happening a lot of times with, uh, we, when, when we start talking about wartime things, right? You know, back, back when I was growing up, one of the catchphrases was uh, peace in the Middle East, right? And, and, and we, we know about the, 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 the Israeli and the Arabs that are fighting all the time. But right now, I mean, you also know that, that we've had that time here for this many, many years where Syria is involved in all this. We've had, we, we've had ISIS and ISIL and we've, we've got the Russians involved in this. We've got the Chinese involved in this. And many of you, many of you that are here, you remember the time of what we called the Cold War, right? When everybody was on pins and needles because we knew that we had nukes pointed at Russia and Russia had nukes pointed at us. And, 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 and so, let me, so let's ask the question. When we talk about having world peace, right? You hear it in every Miss America pageant. When we talk about world peace, what are we talking about? Here's really what we're hoping. We're hoping people will just stop shooting at one another. And that's what we wind up defining as Peace. Oh, they finally got, came to a ceasefire. There's peace. Except here's the problem. In a ceasefire, you might have quit pulling the trigger, but you probably still have the guns pointed, right? And, and just ceasing the hostilities in and of itself might not actually equate to peace. That was the Cold War, right? By that definition, there was peace, but what do we all know? That was not peace. <laughs> Everybody was on eggshells. Nobody knew what was going to happen next. And, and so here, here's what occurs to me. It, it occurs to me that in, that in a large, in many ways in our lives, when we talk about wanting to find peace, a lot of times what we're talking about is, is, is we're looking for peaceful moments. And I think it's worth distinguishing a difference between peaceful moments and true peace. Peaceful moments are, are those times when everybody's running around crazy at your, uh, you know, all around in your life. You got the kids running around your ankles and screaming for this, that, and the other, and, and the work is, and the workload is massively high, or you got armies that have stopped shooting, but they're still pointing guns at one another. There's a peaceful moment. But those things tend to be temporary, right? I mean, we, we had peaceful moments up at Latimer this weekend. You know, the first night we got there before all the rain came, we were able to, to stand out. If you've ever been there, we were able to stand out on the, the, on, on the porch in front of the, the mess hall and look out over this beautiful lake. And it was serene and it was peaceful. But peaceful moments are, tend to be temporary and they tend to come in small doses. Peace... True, honest-to-goodness peace is a state of existence that comes with us constantly. Regardless of the situations, regardless of the external happenings, legitimate peace in life is not dependent upon the absence of conflict, but rather it remains constant even when conflict arises. That's what real peace is. And, and, you, and so one of the things to, to consider is that when we talk about peace, I, I think one of the things that, that we, we get mixed up is that more times than not, we're, and just in the heat of the moment, we're asking for a peaceful moment, but we don't always know about finding peace. What, what is it then? So with that said, what is peace supposed to look like? How do I know if I am at a state of existence in which there is peace in my life or if I'm just living frantically trying to get to the next peaceful moment? Well, I, I think Scripture can give us at least a little bit of insight. Open up to Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, uh, Paul, as he is concluding this letter on joy, 
right? Finding joy regardless of your circumstances. He, he begins, um, <clears throat> as he's concluding his thoughts to this church, he says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, uh, beginning in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I want you to consider the idea that, that if we are trying to understand what peace looks like in our lives, you just have a, a biblical definition of it right there. How do I know? If I am living in a state of peace in my life, well, these things are going to be present. I will be able to rejoice in life. I, I, I will be known as being a reasonable, or some versions will say, let your gentleness be known to all men. I, I will have that reasonable, gentle disposition about me. I'm not going to be plagued by anxiety. Doesn't mean I won't have stressful times, but there's a difference between being stressed and having anxiety, right? I'm not going to be plagued by anxiety all throughout my life. And, 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 and I'm going to be able to enter into that prayer life. It's going to, that prayer life is going to be on the forefront. I'm going to be able to lay those things at God's feet. And I'm going to have as part of that prayer life an immense amount of thanksgiving for the things that I have in my life and the things that are going on in my life. And there's going to be security. There's going to be security around my heart. There's going to be protection uh, around my mind that's going, to, that's going to be with me everywhere that I go. And, and maybe a way to, and if you think that, you know, sometimes we look at it and we tend to isolate all those things. Well, Corey, but he said peace was there at the end. He didn't say all of those were peace. Well, I, 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 let, me, let me give you this challenge. Flip-flop it. I'm saying that this is what it looks like in our lives when we have true peace. How do I know if I don't have peace? Turn it all around. If I don't have peace in my life, then I have no rejoicing. When I have no peace in my life, I'm not going to be known as being reasonable and gentle, but probably frantic and harsh and at people's throats. When I don't have peace in my life, I am going to be plagued by anxiety. Things are going to worry me constantly and there's never going to be a moment in which I cannot settle down or at least I'm not going to be able to settle down for long stretches. I'm constantly worried about the next thing. And when I have no peace, my prayer life is going to be hurting. I'm going to find it difficult to be able to lift my thanksgiving to God because I'm so worried about everything has gone wrong. And when I don't have peace, there's no security. There's no protection around my mind because I'm so scared of, what, uh, of what's going to happen next. I'm too worried about when the other shoe is going to fall. And so I, I, I think as we look at this, may, uh, hopefully what happens is that this illustrates for us, maybe even a little bit more, that peaceful moments, peaceful moments don't remove these things or peaceful moments don't actually make the positive the positive things be consistent true peace makes them consistent and so this morning we ask the question how how then do we grow into a life that is described here in Philippians 4 4 through 7 how do I grow into the state of existence that is guarded and surrounded by the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. And the answer to the question is that in order to know this kind of peace in your life, you must know the ultimate provider of peace. You must know who the ultimate source of it is. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, as we had read for us this morning, a prophecy that is usually understood to be messianic in nature, speaking of the Messiah who was to come. 
The prophet Isaiah writes, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus is our Prince of Peace. As the Prince of Peace, Consider, consider what's, being, what, what's being said to us by, by this description as the prince of this, of this existence. He is the ruler of it. He is the source of inner peace. He is the provider of it, of this peace that remains with us regardless of what the external circumstances are. And when I have the inner peace that comes from knowing the Prince of Peace, the ruler of peace, then it's also going to help me deal with all of these external conflicts. Again, like we said, it doesn't mean the absence of conflict. It means being able to press on and deal with them and still have calmness and peace and be collected in the midst of all of it. So it brings us to this next question then. How? How does Jesus operate as the Prince of Peace? How is He able to provide this kind of existence for us? To answer that question, I'd like for you to turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 8 through 15 here in just a moment. But before we get that, in order to understand how Jesus is able to be the Prince of Peace, the provider of peace in our lives, I, I think it is important uh, for, for us to understand what is the underlying reason for a lack of peace? What is the underlying reason why people don't have it or they spend their whole lives searching for it only to come up short? And I think it's this. I, I, th I want to suggest to you that the underlying reason that we may lack peace in our lives is because we are in conflict with God. God is the creator. God is the sustainer of life. God is the one that when our time on this earth is over, He is the one who is going to hold us accountable for the lives that we have lived on this earth. And when we come to understand that fact, when we know that to be the case, being at odds with God is the ultimate reason for lacking peace at, in one's life. And we'll expound upon that a little bit more in, in, in a bit. But let me even add this. Because being in a room full of Christians, I, you know, when I say we're at conflict with God, I, I'm, I'm going to venture a guess most of us immediately go to, to thoughts of those who are outside of Christ as being in conflict with God. And that's right. But I think we need to also point out that I, I believe it may even be true that some Christians are lacking true peace because they are still living in conflict with God, even though they have the gra His grace. And again, I'll give you more, I I'll expound upon that here in a little bit, but, but, but understand this as we step into our text. As the Prince of Peace, Jesus is the only one who can properly and completely resolve this conflict between us and God. No one else is going to be able to do it. Only Jesus is capable of making that happen. And so in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, verses 8 through 15, Paul describes exactly how Jesus' work brings peace to our conflict with God. Read the text with me if you would. Colossians 2, beginning in verse 8, See to it that no one else takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to the human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled with Him who is the head of all rule and authority. Do you see the whole preeminence thing happening right there? Prince of Peace, so therefore He's the ruler, He's the one over, the head of over all authority, has all authority. So we see that theme coming in already. Picking up verse 11. In Him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith and the powerful working of God, who raised Him from the dead. 
And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This He set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. Again, I point out to you Paul initiates this conversation by showing the supremacy of Jesus. There is no authority higher than Him. And whatever is done by Him is the way to peace with God. You're not going to find true peace through any other philosophy, through any other method, through any other technique. True peace is only going to come through the work of Jesus Christ. There are, there are no other legitimate options. And so what has Jesus done? What has Jesus, uh, what, what, what has He done that actually brings this, this peace in my life? Well, number one, He says there in verse 11 that He has performed, uh, He performs that a spiritual circumcision, and that's kind of odd vernacular or, or odd terminology to use today, but, but it's there. And, and so go think back to this topic of circumcision in, in Scripture. We know that it's a practice that goes back millennia. It was actually something being done before the days of Abraham. Other, other peoples practiced circumcision on their males, but, but God came to Abraham and God gave this practice to Abraham with a different meaning. He actually gave it a, a greater significance than what other cultures had. God gave physical circumcision to the Jewish people as a sign of the special covenant that He made with them. They had been called out of all other nations to live in a special relationship with Him. They had been called out to act differently, to be different. They had been called to be holy in their imitation of the character of God. No other nation had this relationship with God. And by circumcision of the physical flesh, by circumcising the phys physical flesh of their males, they were reminded of this special relationship with Him. It was, it was something that they could connect with in order to remember what they had with Him, in order to remind themselves that they were supposed to be different. The Prince of Peace, as Paul describes here, performs a a spiritual circumcision, a circumcision of the hearts for those that come to Him. That, the, that which is removed is, is the old self, the body of sin, as Paul will call it here. And it's that, that, it's that fleshly nature, it's, it, it's those, those carnal desires that are controlled by selfish physical impulses. And, and when that circumcision of the heart takes place, when, when that changing of the way we think, that changing of the way that we process life happens, what, what, what replaces it, you lose that old self, and He gives to us that new self. No longer controlled by selfish impulses, no longer controlled by fleshly desire and what I want right here, right now, but rather the new self is controlled by the holiness of God's nature. We seek to imitate who God is. We seek to be holy as He is holy. And if you will, what, I, I think what you, you get a parallel here in, in the way that, that the physical circumcision was a sign of the covenant with Israel. And for Christians, this circumcision of the heart is a sign that there is a new relationship between us and God. It is, a, it is a sign, a reminder that we are seeking to be different compared to those around us. That we seek to imitate His holiness in all we do. No longer are we to be like everyone else, but we know that things have changed with God. We are confident in that knowledge, in that truth. And it brings us peace then because, because when this spiritual operation has taken part in your life, 
You know that the conflict is being resolved. You know that your behavior, your actions are going to be more now more in line because you've had this change and because you are seeking something different than before. You are seeking to be in line with God's nature. But, but as he goes on, this, this spiritual operation also means not just that now we are living differently, now that we know how we're supposed to live, but this, this spiritual operation also means that God has made us alive. And he gives two sides of that conversation. First, he, he speaks about how we have been raised from spiritual death through our baptism. Uh, notice what he says in, in verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him who raised uh, through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now look, we, we talk about this a lot within our fellowship especially. We talk about, the, uh, about baptism and the things that happen in it, but, but let, let me just remind us, let's not miss the visual that he's giving here. Let's not miss the symbolism of this great act of faith. What Paul describes here and in passages like Romans chapter 6 is that our baptism directly connects what happens to our souls with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In Romans chapter 6, Paul will, will describe this very same act of being baptized into Christ as the moment in which we die to sin. And what do you do with a dead body? You bury it. And coming out of that water parallels the resurrection of Jesus by, by marking that concrete moment in our life in which our, that concrete moment in which our new life with Him begins. We, ra we are raised to walk in newness of life. Again, Romans chapter 6. But I think it's also critical that, that we... That, that, that we notice what Paul points to as the power for where all of this comes from. Are we raised to new life by our own goodness or power? Absolutely not. There will be those who will point to the, to, to, to the practice of baptism and they say, well, if you believe that baptism is essential to, to receiving your salvation, then you're depending upon a work. No, we're not. No, we're not. That's not what the Bible teaches. And it says just so right there. What does he say? He says that when we submit to baptism in Jesus Christ, what we are depending on is the powerful working of God. Amen? He is the one who makes us clean. He is the one who restores life to our soul. He is the one who rids our hearts of that old self. And elsewhere in Scripture, again, Romans 6 and 1 Corinthians 15, we are told that, that by experiencing this spiritual resurrection, we know that we will also experience a bodily resurrection at the end of time. But Paul goes on in our text here, and, and he says in verses 13 and 14 that we have the forgiveness of trespasses. In my mind, at least for this text, this right here, verses 13 and 14, is where the peace that we are talking about today is really, truly found. You see, our trespasses are what put us in conflict with God, right? Our sins make us dead to Him. Isaiah 59, 2, your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have caused Him to hide His face from you. And Paul illustrates here in, in, in a marvelous way this idea of where the peace comes from. He illustrates it as a transaction of debt. If you have ever been in severe debt, then you know, you know that that state of existence is anything but peaceful, right? You constantly have the creditor hanging over your head, breathing down your neck. Nothing is your own. You must stay on top of that debt. And, and even though you're sending out bill after bill, payment after payment after payment, you never feel like you're getting ahead. You always feel like you just continue to go a little bit deeper. And what's more, if you don't work hard, if you don't keep working harder and harder and harder to pay off that debt, what's eventually going to happen if you can't get it paid off? You're going to lose it all. 
It'll all be taken away, and life as you know it could very well come crashing down. It is indeed an unpeaceful state to live in. Now follow the parallel. Every sin that is committed is a, if you will, a withdrawal from our relationship with God. It puts us further and further away from Him. And in our human ways, in our, in our human tendency, we try harder and harder to make up for the mistakes that we've made. We try every single day to pay off our debt to God if we can. We try to keep the rules better. We try to, to pray a little longer, read a little more. We try to, to do more good things to try to make up for that bad thing I did yesterday. And we do all of this to somehow work our way back into God's good favor. Here's the problem with that though, church. The problem is that our sin has put us in so much debt toward God that you could never repay it. I could never repay it. I'm never going to do enough to compensate for my evil deeds. And the legal actions of debt are, are, are that we lose everything that we are imprisoned because of it. And when you talk about it in the spiritual sense, it goes even further than that. We're not just imprisoned to our sin. It results in our death, our ultimate separation from God when we owe Him because of the debt of sin that we have. But what does Paul say here in Colossians chapter 2, Jesus did? He says that Jesus took that certificate of debt that IOU bill, and he nailed it to the cross. Handful of nails, right, Derek? He nailed it to the cross. And in so doing, he canceled that debt. He made it no longer existent. In bold letters written in his own blood, he said, paid in full. He removed the burden of trying to be righteous on our own merit and made it available through His goodness and through His grace. And when we come to realize that, in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Paul will say, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. Not peaceful moment with God. Not just a moment of quiet reflection. We have peace. Peace with God. Now tell me, tell me that reality doesn't bring joy to your heart. Tell me it doesn't bring you hope. Tell me that this truth won't give you a reason to rejoice and act with gentleness and reasonableness. Tell me that this won't help you lose the anxiety and pray with thanksgiving and have your heart guarded by peace. Tell me that this kind of news is not going to help you understand that all this stuff around here is temporal, but this is eternal. We have peace with God through the work of Jesus Christ. And the, the reason we have peace with God is because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Now as we wrap this up, Let's make sure that we understand why this conversation is so important. Because there are some who are here today who are listening to, to these words that we are saying and, and, and you are listening and you don't know peace. You don't have peace in your life because you don't know the Prince of Peace. You are living in a state of constant conflict with God. And I think... I think there are three main ways that such conflict with God happens so as to remove that sense of peace. Number one, some of us here are legitimate enemies of God. We are not in Christ. In Romans chapter 5, verse 10, he talks about the reality of being an enemy of God. It indicates that there is an actual state of existence in which this is our relationship to our Creator. And in Colossians 1.21, Paul will describe what that looks like. He says, and you who you once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. 
Folks, some people want to try to think there's a middle ground that, you know, maybe I'm not his friend, but I'm not his enemy either. That's not the way the Bible describes it. You are either God's friend or you are God's enemy. And if you are not in Christ, the Bible says that we are God's enemies in that condition. And so this morning, this morning, I, we, we plead with you, it's time to make a change. It's time to let go of the chaos and let Jesus bring you the peace through your faith and the power of His working. And so I would leave you with the question, won't you come today and give your life to Him in the waters of baptism? What would stop you from doing that if you know that that's what you need to do with your life? But I said earlier quickly that, that there are some Christians, I think, who are listening this morning, who are still living in conflict with God, albeit in a little different way. Some of us are living a life that is, that is like the high-speed lifestyle we talked about earlier. You know, with the mom or the guy at work. And even though you've been given the grace of God, you're still working harder and harder and harder as though you have to be the one that gets ahead of all of this. You're trying to do what's right and you're thinking about it constantly and moving, always moving, but, but the more we move, the more, mistake, the more mistakes we make and the more mistakes we make, the more we fret and the more that we fret, the less peace we have in our lives. You know, maybe I did okay today, but it might all come crashing down tomorrow. Sounds an awful lot like Paul's writings in Romans 7, does it not? I know what I want to do and I know and, and I agree that the law of God is good but, but I don't do the law of God and so then I find myself, I don't want to do these bad things but, but, but I want to do the good things but I don't do the good things and I wind up doing the bad things and he's just back and forth and back and forth and you hear the chaos and he finally throws up his hands and he says, oh wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this? Answer, the Prince of Peace. And then there's some of us here who feel like we're living in a cold war with God. You've obeyed the gospel. You know you've received forgiveness for your sins. But, and, and, and so you know that that means God's no longer aiming the lightning bolt at you. However, in your mind, you, you, you're, you're looking at this as saying, well, maybe He's not pointing it at me, but He's still got it in His hand. And he's waiting. He's just, he's just waiting for me to, to put one little thing out of line. And if I put one little thing out of line, the gun's going to come back up and God's going to be ready to smite me dead. And if I put one toe out of place, boom, it could be all over. Sure, he's not firing at us, but there's an ever-present tension. And you spend every day walking on eggshells, terrified of what could happen with your relationship with God. Folks, Neither one of those is peace. Neither one of those is peace. That's chaos looking for the next peaceful moment. But Jesus is offering you and me something that is so much better than either one of those. And we need to recognize it for what it is and lavish in it because it is what God has given Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God because of the Prince of Peace. If we can help you this morning, deal with the chaos in your life. Let us know right now while we stand and sing.